Now, I would like to invite our respected team, Executive Civil Engineering, Professor Dr. Kutiko Rehman, to welcome the source person and the parts. In round of applause, Professor Dr. Kutiko Rehman. Good evening, Dr. 
chief guest and Mr. Poison, Doctor and Tori and Morris, River Hygonics, and River Morphology Expert, and a renowned Frontal Virus Alimentation Expert, Dr. Tabasu Zahu, a very renowned consultant. Professor Dr. Nur Mahmud R, Director of Center of Excellence in Water Resource and Electronic, distinguished guests, fellow engineers, scientists, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, and very warm good morning to everyone. It is a matter of immense pleasure and great honor for me to warmly welcome all of you, and particularly to Dr. Morris who is expert in Rural Wild Sustainability. In today's seminar, challenges to sustaining water, storing and in this basement. You know, today's topic is very much challenging. And today's speaker is also an authority in the Reservoir sustainability. He has carried out reservoir sedimentation study of in the Villa Reservoir sometime back in 2014. And that he has produced a very comprehensive report on reservoir sedimentation and giving some solutions how to gather a sedimentation problem all in the Villa Reservoir. May we mention the tragic of the sediment from this very large reservoir and also the sediment flushing. And he also conducted and uh, mentioned the consequences of the flushing if the flushing is being carried out for that very large reservoir. So, this I, I have gone through, through, through his uh, uh, report. Uh, when I was doing the six periodic inspection of the Torreira and his report was very useful in that study. You know, his handbook on reservoir sedimentation is also a very comprehensive book on reservoir sedimentation. And in this book, he has also uh, given case studies of several reservoirs of the world. Including the San Mexia Reservoir, whose reservoir capacity was recovered by five, six steps, which he had mentioned in a very nice manner. In this, you know, the other topic is uh, belongs to the Indus River. Indus is a mighty river. And we cannot make small dams on this mighty river. Because Large 
if x height is greater than 15 meter, even the dam is called notch if x height is 5 to 15 meter, but if it holds the water storage more than 3 meters. So, yes, we should get some more dams on smaller, smaller island peaks, and that we are doing. And you know, our provincial education departments, they are looking at these STO, small dam organizations. Organization as per I code, none of them is small as per definition of I code because their height is more than 15 meters. All small dams, if you see, I, I think around 64 small dams in Punjab. So I am highly thankful to the director, Center of Excellence, for his consistent efforts in improving uh, the Center of Excellence and arranging so many seminars, conferences, and workshops. And I hope that the participants will get maximum benefit from the talk of Dr. Morris, who is a learned man in this field. And uh, we can apply the techniques which we will learn from him to our local reservoirs. So special thanks to the Director Center of Excellence, Water Resources Engineering for organizing such beautiful seminar. And also highly thankful to the organizers of this seminar, particularly Dr. Kalim Server and engineer Avas Zafar. So a special thanks to today's guest speaker, uh, Dr. Morris. Thank you very much, sir, for sparing time and being with us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your warmly welcome over resource person and participant and thoroughly introduce over today resource person. Now I would like to invite our worthy director, CWRE Professor Dr. Noor Muhammad Khan for the introduction of the center and its contribution in research. In round of applause, Professor Dr. Noor Muhammad Khan. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa jassir li amri. Thank you very much, uh, Aves, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Habib, for your uh, warm welcome to the participants and the resource person. Uh, I am indeed thankful to uh, Dr. Morris uh, for his uh, uh, sparing the time for our Center of Excellence. Uh, I will briefly introduce my center, considering this opportunity to propagate uh, the uh, presence of my center. So, uh, my presentation will contain few slides about the center. Those who are not familiar with it, they will know uh, the purpose of the center and what we are doing. And uh, I will not take much time because today main event is to have uh, knowledge from a very uh, knowledgeful person. Uh, and we know that talking to a knowledgeful person for one hour is better than uh, a year of study of the books. So we will be talking to him a lot uh, in the remaining time, but briefly, let me introduce, uh, I, let me take this opportunity to introduce my center. Uh, center was uh, founded in 1976 within the uh, University of Engineering and Technology. And sir, this university is one of the oldest university in Pakistan uh, in engineering and technology. And uh, many of uh, engineers working in WAPDA in irrigations are uh, graduate either from the University of Engineering and Technology or from this center. The purpose of uh, uh, this center was uh, to uh, create a seed of uh, learning and dissemination of knowledge with respect to water resources. And we are following this vision of the center that we want to generate knowledge for local and global competitive advantage and become a leading world class water related institute. So five, six main purpose were uh, assigned to us. One was teaching and research. Another was training of the research workers and establishing masters and PhD level courses and then dissemination of the knowledge through conferences, seminars, workshops. So this, work, this seminar is part of our uh, duty that we have to uh, uh, inter, uh, interact with the industry, we have to interact with the consultants so that the knowledge can be disseminated. 
Um, briefly, we are about 45 year old. Uh, currently, we have about 150 students. We are running uh, four master's programs and three PhD programs. And we have a good uh, resource of alumni working in a uh, uh, field related to water resources. These are the master's programs uh, and PhD programs and the uh, uh, chronology of their starting over here. Our, one of the uh, main program is water resources engineering, uh, which is successfully being done over here. And allied programs are water resources management, hydropower and hydrology. Uh, we have good resource of in infrastructure uh, seven eight uh, laboratories including a hydraulic engineering laboratory hydrology laboratory modern tray hall and if time permitted we will be visiting modern tray hall we have a good uh, collection of the books uh, related to water resources more than 15,000 books are available over here and you can search them online also uh, with respect to sediments and sediment modeling the capability which we have that i would like to introduce uh, in the coming slides but a brief uh, review uh, of the last year performance of my center in respect of uh, research papers, in respect of technology development, in respect of uh, research projects, in respect of uh, conferences, seminars that is presented over here. The topic uh, of interest of my faculty and the students are mentioned over here, uh, including the uh, water conveyance uh, and system operations, water budgeting, water resource monitoring, a glacier a melting and the impact of the climate change on availability of the water resources and, uh, and sediment erosion. We have the capability at the center to carry out the numerical and physical modeling uh, of the sediments in the channel and the sediment erosion or sediment yield of the catchment. Uh, for example, we, can, we have carried out and we can carry out the numerical simulation uh, using 1D modeling, using uh, quasi 2D models and even uh, I have, uh, we have carried out study of uh, uh, 3D uh, sediment modeling at the intake of the Kohala, uh, Kohala uh, hydropower projects using SIM model. Uh, I think five, five, seven years ago, we have carried it out. And uh, now we can do uh, CFD modeling uh, for a small reach uh, using flow 3D CFD models over here. Similarly, we have been working over here and in civil engineering department to optimize the operation of the reservoirs for different objective functions, for uh, maximizing the economic benefit, for reducing the sediment loss, for reducing the flooding. So for different, uh, uh, for different objective functions, we can carry out the simulation and it can tell us how to operate a reservoir so that the benefit can be increased. And a series of studies have been carried out. For example, initially we carried out optimization for a single reservoir. Then one of our PhD students have carried out optimization of two reservoir in series. And then now uh, our one of the student Mohsin is doing uh, uh, optimization of the reservoir, considering sediment evacuation from the reservoir for parallel reservoir. We have a setup of parallel reservoir, Mangla and Tarbela. So they are uh, parallel. So it is a separate problem as compared to a series of Similarly, sediment uh, yield and sediment erosion in the catchment has been of interest. Uh, Professor Habib, a PhD, was in this field. He applied distributed uh, sediment erosion model, and he have found back in 2000 uh, what will be the effect of the land use change, what will be the effect of the uh, 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 scale change of the of the scale change of the catchment on the equations which which predict the sediment yield. So such uh, sediment modeling, uh, we have the facility and our students are doing it. Nowadays, uh, our students are more using GIS based SWOT model to carry out to see the impact of different variations, different changes, different management scenarios in the catchment. And similarly, we have flume available in which we can carry out the sediment modeling in the channel. So a uh, long list of uh, researches are available in center's library, you people can access them. I have just highlighted that we have a variety of the case studies, Tarbela, Mangla, and other places. Uh, and we have carried out a variety of research on sediment load, yield, and catchment from, from the catchment. So I will not go through them. Uh, this is contribution of some of the research is carried out at civil engineering department. So I will like to just uh, uh, go through or two researches, one carried out at civil engineering, being carried out 
Mohsin Munir is carried out from Nespark and he is optimizing the rule curves of Terbela and Mangra reservoirs for different objective functions. So uh, there is no time that I should go through all of it, but I just want to give you message that parallel reservoir is a special problem in hydrology and hydraulics and optimization of their operation. Uh, I, I should tell you that our reservoirs are being operated without any optimization study. They are being uh, carried out based upon the previous experience. Still, they have not optimized them. So if we use such studies, we can enhance their benefits with the uh, uh, present infrastructure itself. So this is the framework of its optimization model. There is, it is a combination of a sediment evacuation model, genetic algorithm model, reservoir operation or simulation model, and power generation and flood computation model. So I will just show you uh, its objective function, and uh, uh, he can uh, optimize the economic benefit or the irrigation uh, deficit can be reduced. I will just focus on one of the scenario he has carried out. For example, if he give priority to the sediment evacuation or conservation of the storage, so sediment conservation uh, benefits can be enhanced to 24 million US dollar as compared to if we operate it as it is 9 million US dollar benefits we are getting. So we can enhance it to 24 million US dollar uh, so there are many supposition. We, we repeated the flows which were observed in the last 30 years. We have not considered the climate change. So there are uh, many uh, uh, assumptions also there, but we have the tool available. If the data is strengthened, we can optimize the reservoir for different, for different uh, objective functions. Uh, then we can ultimately give to the operator the rule curves which will enhance its benefit. So I will go to the... Uh, Next study, that is the application of the SWAT model, uh, soil water uh, analysis tool, to carry out the effect of the climate change on two of the uh, small uh, watersheds in Upper Indus Basin. So Mr. Muin and his supervisor, they have carried out this research, and they have found that because of the climate change up till 2100, the flows will enhance in, by 14% in Gilgit catchment. So this upper one is a Gilgit catchment, and uh, sediment will enhance by 24% because of new climate precipitation, new precipitation in the coming decades and new temperature in the coming decades. And in the another neighboring catchment, Gorban uh, catchment, 13% uh, uh, water we are expected to enhance and 20% sediment. So we have found that sediment uh, impact is more, climate change impact on the sediment is more as compared to this. So uh, I will not take more time. So I want to fi finally uh, give this message to that we are losing. If we see the data of Pakistani reservoir, we have about 15 million acre feet or about 18 billion cubic meter of storage. And we are losing storage uh, at a rate of about 1%. Tarbela is a little bit smaller, Mangla and Chachma is losing uh, a little bit higher uh, rate of storage. Uh, we have lost about 38% of our storage in last 36, 40 years. As compared to this, Europe and uh, USA is not losing because of their watershed management, because of their climate, because of their rainfall. They have much less uh, uh, storage loss. Our problem is particular for Pakistan, and it is similar problem is there in China, I think in this region, which are surrounding the Himalaya area. So we have to have our local solutions for that, and I will request uh, uh, our worthy resource person that please tell us that what are the possible ways of reducing uh, this impact. Uh, the impact of this losing 1 million cubic meter of the reservoir can be translated into money terms that approximately 1 to 1.5 million US dollar are required for creating a million cubic meter if we see the cost of the previous uh, reservoirs. So that is the approximate cost. So if I quantify the cost of the uh, storage lost in last 30, 40 years, that comes out to be about $7 billion. So we, can, we could have saved it, not entirely, but to some extent we could have saved it if better sediment management could have been done. So we should uh, create new reservoirs as it is envisaged in uh, national water policy. We should create reservoirs, but at the same time, we should 
manage sediments also either by reducing the inflows or by managing it in the reservoir through better operation through sluicing hydro section and hopefully we will be learning a lot from dr morris today with this i am again thankful uh, to dr morris dr uh, tabassum zahoor dr tabassum zahoor has been faculty over here and we are happy to see him again over here and many other senior person thank you very much for joining over here sir and to my students special thanks to yasir who have made this event possible when he told me uh, about 2 3 weeks ago dr morris is coming so i requested him please uh, get some time from him so that he could visit over here and we can learn from him thank you very much yasir and the whole team dr kaleem and their fellows thank you very much sir for introducing center in a such a magnificent way and we believe in your leadership we will touch this sky no dr morris uh, dr gregory morris has no need to introduce further as dr abibur rahman has introduced him but i will add one to two line here he is a partner in glm engineering group puerto rico usa and he is the expert in water resources and sedimentation with experience in 13 countries he is the author of reservoir uh, reservoir sedimentation handbook and numerous research paper and book chapters no in, in i would like to invite dr morris for the, his presentation in today's seminar in round of applause professor dr morris is the preservation of surface water storage. So when we talk about water development, we're not talking about developing new sources of water. What we're basically talking about is uh, developing storage. Because most of the water supply in this is already abstracted. So what we need to do is provide sufficient storage so we can regulate that water uh, in the optimal manner. 
There is very little water that reaches the sea. So the idea now is that we expect, we hope, that we'll be around for hundreds of additional years, thousands of additional years, hopefully. So when we develop the water resources, we need to think that this is a permanent change and it has to be sustainable for long, in the long term. We can't focus in on solving today's problems and problems for our children and forget about our grandchildren and their children. So we have to think 200, 300, 500 years in the future. How will this work in the long term? We're not building a pump station. Pump station, the pump gets destroyed, you can go and buy another one and install it. We're not building a road. The road is too young, it's too small, you go back and build another one. Reservoirs are different. How many dam sites are there? There's only a limited number of dam sites there. And what happens when a dam gets full of sediment? You can't use it again. You can reconstruct the dam, but the reservoir, once it's full of sediment, absolutely useless. Can you take the sediment out of the reservoir? We're going to put it. We're talking here huge volumes of sediment. Huge volumes of sediment. See Tarbella Dam, the dam itself, huge structure. The annual sediment load is larger than the size of the dam. The dam is about 150 million cubic meters, the sediment load is even larger than that in one year. So, uh, groundwater development is continuing now. There are more than 1 million wells, and the report says the aquifer is becoming seriously over traffic. Uh, and the other water is used inefficiently. Low levels of economic productivity. You look at the storage loss on Tardella. This is a usual storage. Storage loss for you. So, one of the uh, Pipe Senate 2018 developed a national water policy. And some of these policies are being implemented. I just want to call your attention to some of the potential conflicts that there are within these policies. One of the primary emphasis is to increase the efficiency of service water use. You can find now that to use more efficient online irrigation. But when you use water, quote unquote, efficiently in the irrigation, what you're talking about is minimizing the percolation. In other words, minimizing the amount that seeps into the aquifer so that all the water goes through 
dumb and elaborate. They accept for the amount of water you need to control so many. If you have a crop, you deliver water per crop, and you don't have enough water to wash salts out of the crop to itself down deeper, that zone of soil will become saline eventually. And this is no longer useful for crop production. So you have to deliver the crop requirements plus enough water for salt tank. But if you're joining the line of the house, and you read the video, how much is going to reduce your output for sure? Another thing that I'll talk about is solarization and irrigation costs. If energy is free, does that mean farmers are going to use more popular groundwater? I don't know. But these are the types of questions that need to be asked. These are research questions. These are practical research questions that need to go into uh, actual implementing the policy. In some areas, if you have saline groundwater, yes, that makes sense to mine these mouths. However, the mouth is you charge the capital for it. How do you measure your vision? The conveyance system is an input, output, and loss. This loss will be the same. And this is the boundary you can use for your efficiency calculations. So, if you have inputs, outputs, and now water, the water from loss to the seepage goes into the gap. But is this is the proper boundary when you talk about efficiency. You could use probably more appropriate now plus the well, because the well is very important for irrigation. And one of the important aspects of wells is well flow is controlled by the farmer. Irrigation the canal is controlled by the government. So studies have shown that the well water is twice as productive as the canal water. Why? The farmer controls it. If your crops need water today, you can come on and deal with the crop water today. If you need a crop, they use water today and not now. You have to wait for the water to be delivered to you and not have direct control over the water. So, this is a more productive water source than compared to canals. Canal seepage goes to charge the aquifer and use the well. So, here is a larger boundary for the definition of efficiency. So, be careful when you talk about efficiency. Uh, where you put your boundaries and what the implications are. So, what is water resource development? Traditionally, we construct a new five cubic kilometer storage project that's developed, uh, drilling a uh, new well or maybe a canal that's developed. But let's think in a different way. What if you make an existing project sustainable to avoid? Five kilometers of storage loss. That's also called you can build a new project or you can fix an existing project. In either case, you get five kilometers of five cubic kilometers of storage. Or what about using the aquifer for storage? The aquifer doesn't have a segmentation problem. So you can use aquifer storage as a cover. These would put water into the aquifer and draw it out. So these are again different concepts of water development that are very pertinent to the situations, many situations that one is. We talk about water in terms of typically total and along, yet the real measure is the timing of the delivery. If you deliver water when it's not necessary, and I've seen irrigation districts that say, oh, we offer this much water. But when you look at the numbers, well, you're offering the water when it's raining. So you look at the offering of water to farmers, and it's a big number. But you look at the number that's actually available to farmers when they need it, the numbers are very different. So again, it's not just a question of what the total quantity is, it's the timing of the And because groundwater offers are better timing, we do have to go to the most 
you get a holistic viewpoint here. You can't just say, oh, this is surface water and that's groundwater. They're, they're linked together. It's like in a family, you have a husband and a wife, but they're not separate entities. They're holding together in a household. So it's not the same situation here. One of the things that needs to be done is to develop a comprehensive groundwater model, which is basically a large deficiency today. Uh, develop practical oriented research programs to look at the fishing relationship. Because if you don't have a reliable model, surface groundwater, whatever, if you do not have a reliable, good model, you are going to have unexpected consequences. It's like driving a car down the road and your model in your mind says, oh, no one's going to be coming from this direction, and they're coming from that direction. But you didn't have it in your mind that that could happen, and all of a sudden you find yourself in an accident. So that's not a thing to come up with. The supreme importance of reservoir fuel is capacity. I'm going to get the water is absolutely you need to go to the to offset our storage loss. We cannot recover lost storage. Why can we not recover it? Where are we going to put this up? We can't just take it out and put it somewhere. Where is that somewhere? So the focus needs to be preventing storage loss. And my entire power irrigation operations is critical. And fortunately, Pakistan's uh, power requirements are higher in the summer, which is also when you have more water. So this coincides nicely with high power generation. So they need to work together, but there needs to be flexibility. And we have to be able to accept this along the whole Let's talk about Peter and Stalin. For about, uh, like I said, the dam itself is a show that they can't unborn. This is a five or seven from the South River in one year. When it was built, this was the largest man made structure in the world. 150 and some odd million new years of built through. Here's the power house right inside the shoulder. The uh, reservoir is about 88 kilometers long, and the delta extends down to this area here. Most of the center comes down to the ACM, about the Sierra River, it's about 4% below. Reservoirs one day. Accumulate sediment, you typically have two general areas. You have delta, and then you have fine sediments. You can talk about the top set bed, the top of the delta, the four set bed, base of the delta, and then the bottom set of deposits. If you have turbidity currents, the turbidity current can flow downstream, create a muddy lake, which is just mud.
Now I have two microphones. Put this in the pocket. So, and these simulations assume no change in hydrology, no climate change impacts, and no change in water demand. We don't know exactly what climate change is going to do, but we do know it will increase water demand because of increased heat. And we do know that uh, water demand is also increasing uh, because the expanded irrigation areas. I take these so I, I have an itchy throat. So, and these work. <clears throat> So even within the period of 20 years, we can see a significant change in water availability for irrigation. We run these simulations out. Uh, here is the, uh, the volume loss by sedimentation. And here is the percent of days the reservoir is empty. And you'll see that in the past, no problem. But the future, your rate of failure begins to increase quite dramatically. We're here. Uh, there's no time to uh, postpone working on the situation. A solution needs to be found. So, I would just like to impress upon you the urgency of focusing on this problem. Because when you don't have water for irrigation, 
there's a lot of people on the delta. I mean, on the on the on the on the floodplain. But 80 million people depend on irrigation, and there's no water for irrigation. It's an economic problem. It's a social problem. It's a political problem. It's a problem at all levels. <clears throat> Hydrologic cycle will sustain flows for millions of years. But if you cannot regulate the irregular flows <coughs> provided by nature, unless you have storage. And surface water storage is not sustainable if you can't control sedimentation. You have to maintain storage. There is no alternative. And you have to maintain it for long periods of time hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. When you run out of storage, kaput. So you have an increasing population, what, 300 million by 2050? The projection is to increase storage with new reservoirs, but that storage has to be maintained in the long term. You cannot have new storage and then lose it just like Tarbella is being lost while your population continues to go up and your demand for water continues to go up. And storage is only sustainable when you achieve a balance between the sediment inflow and the sediment outflow. There's a number of ways that that can be done. We won't go into that here, but basically you can do catchment management, although in the upstream of uh, Tarbella, there's not a lot of opportunity because it's by Himalaya, higher natural erosion rates. And it's one of the studies we saw here is that climate change will increase the water supply, but will increase even more the sediment supply. So think about that. So here we have the original condition in the river. We have sediment is balanced, inflow, outflow. You build the dam, you have a temporary sediment imbalance. Temporary. And then at some point you make a decision. I'm going to lose my storage or I'm going to maintain my storage. But under either situation, the sediment will become rebalanced. See? The sediment flows downstream under both options. You cannot stop sediment from arriving at your dam, especially here. You cannot stop it. You cannot fight erosion in geology. It will overwhelm you. So the decision is basically this or this, long term. Dasu, very little storage for sediment. Uh, Dagra Basha has, uh, has significant volume, but if we construct Dagra Basha and allow the dead pool to fill with sediment, it's about two cubic kilometers, that would give us about 20 years of additional storage at Tarbella. If you allow it to fill completely, I get seven years at Tarbella, but again, what do you do after 70 years? What do you do after 100 years? What do you do after 200 years? Where will you be at year 300? That's, that's long term. All new water development initiatives should support long term sediment management to maximize long-term storage. You have to have the storage. So let's think about this. Uh, I drove by the Lahore Canal and I looked up on Wikipedia, built by the Mughals, upgraded by the British, been in operation for several hundred years. All of Pakistan's barrages and canals were constructed with the envision of enlarging and extending a traditional irrigation system that's been in use for thousands of years. So these are, this is sustainable development. You 
build canals and you establish that this is the way it's going to work in the future. But let's look at Wikipedia 100 years from now. And this is what you do not want to read 100 years from now. Multiple storage reservoirs were built along the Indus between 1976 and 2076. They were all lost to sedimentation within 100 years, leaving Pakistan without the means to regulate flows. Designers and structures did not prioritize the long-term need for storage to feed the canal system. Inability to regulate flow of the Indus has been a major factor impeding the country's agricultural and economic development. This is not sustainable. So it's changing a concept because this is not the way reservoirs everywhere in the world. And I'm not talking just Taka. This is everywhere in the world. I give this lecture country after country after country. And it's the same story everywhere. Because traditionally, reservoirs are designed with a hundred year life. This is a traditional way of doing things. But the United States built a lot of reservoirs a long time ago, and now they are 50 or 100 years old, and they have the situation, well, yes, it worked exactly as we needed for the first 100 years, but what do we do now? Because it's filling with sediment, it's starting to impair the operation of the reservoir. The need for the reservoir didn't disappear after 100 years. You have an irrigation district, you have communities that use the water supply. Everybody needs the water and now you have sediment. So the idea is to start thinking now of how you're going to develop it in the future. Maybe you don't start managing it for sediment day one. Maybe you'll have outlet works that the dam is designed so you can put gates and low level outlets or, or bypass tunnel. 50 years in the future. You don't have to do it today, but think of the future. So in 50 years, we're going to do this, or we're going to design it so that it will accommodate this future uh, modification. A number of reservoirs in different parts of the world we work with to do retrofits so that they can operate sustainably for a long period of time. And this can be done, but it's much easier if the project is designed initially thinking far into the future, this is what we will do in the future. At Tarbella, the do nothing alternative does not exist. Because if we do nothing, you're going to dis eventually fill with sediment and the sediment will discharge over the spillway. The water goes over the spillway and goes down and there's a flip bucket. You'll hit 140 feet per second in the flip bucket for the main spillway. You put 60 million tons of sand, the sand component of the sediment load, 60 million tons of sand, 140 feet per second on a flip bucket, destroy it, one monsoon season. So you have an unsafe operation. Also, when you deposit sediment, uh, I don't know if you know, but you have Tarbella, and about seven kilometers downstream, you have the, the barrage for Gassi Barotha, which is what, 1600 megawatts, I think. So in that head pond area, the sediment that goes over the spillways would accumulate there, and then raise the tailwater and flood the Tarbella powerhouse. So this is not an option. You can discharge through the turbines at Tarbella. Also not an option. Not only do you destroy the turbines, but again, the Gassi Barotha head pond becomes filled with sediment. Another option is to flush through low level outlets. A study was done about 10, 12 years ago that looked in detail about construction of nine, between eight and 10 tunnels, each of them 10 meters in diameter. It would be constructed in very bad rock and these would discharge below Gassi Barotha. But you have to turn the power plant off for at least a month, if not longer. Tarbella produces power at, in US dollars, 0.8 cents per kilowatt. 
If you purchase power from a coal plant or another source, you pay 12 cents. So if you're going to take Tarbella and Gassibarotha offline for a month and purchase that power, assuming it's available from somewhere, you're talking about $500 million a month of power purchase. With $500 million, you can do a lot of dredging. And if you dredge, you do not have to lower the water level. You can continuously produce power. So this is one of the, the options that has not been looked at uh, very seriously, but definitely warrants a lot of consideration. Because if you dredge, one of the problems, <coughs> for instance, if you flush, you're going to dump a huge amount of sediment into the Indus River all at once. If you dredge, you can put out one dredge in the reservoir and start dredging and watch how that sediment can be managed. Then you put a second dredge, then you put a third dredge. So you can manage the discharge downstream. So there's a lot, there's a lot of, of things to think about here. What is clear is you cannot continue to operate Tarbella as it has been operated. In other words, operational expenses have been limited to power plant. Turned off. Microphone turned off. The microphone turned off. You can't continue just to the uh, power plant. You will have to manage sediment, and managing sediment is expensive, but it means your power cost may go up from less than one cent to two cents. It still is the cheapest source of power available. Battery change. Hello? Is it back again? Not, not yet. Not yet. Okay. We'll use this microphone now. So basically, these are the options that you have available. And they, they, they need to be looked at seriously and something needs to be done in the near future. Uh, we don't know the answer. The answer on the Indus is very complex. It's one of the most complex problems in the world in terms of sediment management. A very challenging problem. There is no simple solution, but you don't really have an option of ignoring it. So a little bit about dredging, but Basically, the dredging system would uh, be placed at the face of the delta. Floating pipeline, uh, you can go over the dam or through a tunnel. And the floating pipeline would then, from here down to below Garcia Barota, you can go by gravity. It's, um, it's expensive, but it's probably less expensive than the other alternatives. So these are the main reservoirs that are uh, existing or proposed, but there's also a lot of other reservoirs, smaller reservoirs that are being built on tributaries. And again, let's look at the long-term concepts that are being considered. Uh, here's uh, a quote from a report from one of these smaller reservoirs. 
It says flushing operations are not recommended because the predicted life under normal operations is more than 100 years. We're back to the 100 year problem. At this particular site, 100 years, a third of the useful capacity will already be gone. So it's not a question of just the big reservoirs on the main stem. It's all of your reservoirs. Because you build a reservoir, you develop a command area, and what happens? After 100 years, everyone is producing crops, and you say, well, you lost your water supply. You can't do that. One other thing I want to bring to your attention is economic analysis. Pre, uh, typically, you'll have some sort of a benefit cost analysis, but economic analysis uses what's called a discount rate, and you discount the future, value of future. For instance, if I say, do you want to have $100 today or $100 in five years? And everyone's going to say, well, I'll take $100 today. So therefore, they say, well, I'll give you $100 today or $200 in five years. And then that's kind of a more of a question mark. Or $100 today or $1,000 in five years. Well, I think it'd probably go for $1,000. But this is discounting because the value of future income is less valuable than what you have in hand today. And what you do in economic analysis, if you have an expenditure, if it costs $100 a day, and then you take your benefit stream, you discount the benefit stream in the future. Now, at Tarbella, they were using a 12% discount rate. At 12% discount rate, $100 is equal to $100 if it's spent today. But at year 20, that $100 is worth only $7.76. And in 30 years, it's worth $2.16. At 50 years, it's worth 17 cents. So what does this mean? Anything 50 years in the future, from the standpoint of an economist, literally does not exist. Now, I don't think you want to uh, think in terms of 50 years from now, there's no more future. So when you use an economic analysis, you have to be aware of the trap of discounting, it's particularly at very high discount rates. The future does not exist. But we're talking about water supply for a nation, and we cannot apply discounting to water supply for a nation. For instance, you build a dam, the dam has to be safe. It's an absolute requirement that the dam is safe. You do not discount, say, well, it's safe today, but in 50 years it will fail, but I don't care about the lives of people 50 years in the future, so we'll let it fail in 50 years. You, you don't do that because it has to be safe today and in the future. Why do you design for earthquakes with a 1,000 or 10,000 year return interval? Same with floods. So the sustainability is not something that should be subject to discounting. It should be a requirement. And funny thing happens. When you establish an engineering requirement, engineers are pretty interesting people, and engineering problems are very interesting. I know that very early in my career, when I was started working with this, we were looking at reservoir designs, and I turned the question around and said, I said, what if I designed with the requirement that it has to be sustainable? And all of a sudden, when that requirement is set as a necessity, the design problem changes and you find a different solution. So I would recommend that you think about looking at sustainability as a requirement. So 
as your the lower discount rate gives more weight to future values. For instance, here's a 7% discount rate. Your value at 30 years of $100 goes to 11. If I bring the discount rate to 3%, my $100 is worth $40 in year 30. So use of the discount rate is very sensitive to the results you get from an economic analysis. And who determines the discount rate? It is a magic number. And it's, there are arguments in every side of this on which number you should use. It's a rather arbitrary number. So, closing thoughts. You need modeling tools, practical research. Universities are great with this. And you need this so that you avoid unintended consequences. You need to understand how the system works. You need to manage the whole system. Surface water, groundwater, it's all the same water. You have to manage it as a system. Remember your groundwater can be an important component of the storage. You have a projection of population year 2050. You have a, a projection of storage requirements. How are you going to develop and maintain forever that storage? And finally, if you don't have a viable long-term strategy for managing sediment that's preserved to preserve storage, you don't have a viable strategy. This is a very complex problem. Again, let me repeat, the Indus is probably the most complex sediment management problem in the world. Uh, it's a very interesting problem because of its complexity. Uh, it's a very difficult problem because of its complexity. And you have a huge challenge in front of you. And start to work and you know, continue the work in that direction. And really, everybody needs to get behind this. And, and a solution will be found. There are solutions. We don't know what they are today, but they will be found. So thank you very much. I think that's the end of it. Uh, you can get the book on the internet. Both of these books are available on the internet for free, PDF copies. Uh, go to ReservoirSedimentation.com. You can get either one of them, both of them, and some other papers. So with that, I think I will finish. All of the downstream infrastructure will be impacted negatively. Um, but look at the Kabul River. Kabul River has a large sediment load, and they have irrigation intakes, and they're able to manage the sediment. Uh, look at the irrigation system and the barrages before Carbella was built. They were able to manage the sediment. The impacts will be large. The impacts will be negative. But you don't have a choice. In the long term, you do not have a choice. The Himalaya is not going to stop delivering sediment into this river. So uh, for that reason, I say that the earlier you start working with the problem, the earlier you can get reach a solution.
Yeah, the question is, if I were the operator of Tabella 30 years ago, would I have operated the way it's been operated? And basically, I think I would, because what the operation of Tabella has been to date to try and keep the sediment out of the turbines. So that's why it's been going up year by year. Uh, it's not a bad operation, and the operator does not have a lot of flexibility because he does not have the method to discharge sediment. Now, to discharge sediment through the low level, uh, the tunnels, for instance, the delta has to reach the tunnel. And then that is a problem with the power intakes. So yes, in terms of uh, historical operation, I do not have an issue with the way it's been operated. I'm just saying that for the future, there needs to be a change in the structure and the operating rule. There is no example. There's no example of this size dredging anywhere in the world. Uh, this would become the largest dredging project in the world. Uh, but the thing with dredging is that it's a scalable technology. So if you can dredge with one dredge, a small dredge, a big dredge, multiple dredges, this would require multiple large dredges. But the dredging technology is very well known. Uh, dredging technology has been around for 100 years, you know, modern dredging technology. So uh, there are some unknowns of typically, basically the abrasion rate of the pipeline, because pipeline replacement uh, is a significant cost factor. Uh, you do have the advantage that you can use an electric dredge using self-supplied power from Tarbella, which is probably one of the cheapest sources of energy in the world. So uh, dredging costs, uh, depending on fuel costs, the fuel can cost 30 to 50 percent of your dredging costs. If you have a very cheap source of energy, like at Tarbella, that reduces your power. Also at Tarbella, the sediments are ideal size for dredging. They're fine sands and silts. And typically in dredging, you have very high velocities in the pipeline. Uh, we just designed the project in Puerto Rico for dredging of a reservoir, and we're looking at pipeline velocities of 12 to 15 feet per second. At that velocity, you have a lot of friction loss. Turbella, you can probably use velocities that are half of that, and your friction loss will be much less. Why? Because you don't have gravels. If you start, if you move from fine sand to coarse sand, your velocity requirements double. The reason for the high velocity is you do not want the sediment to accumulate and clog the pipeline. So Tarbella, we have an ideal size material for dredging and we can use a lower velocity, cheap power, and that's what makes it economical. This is not, dredging is not a general solution. I never recommend dredging as a first alternative. I was very surprised when going through Tarbella, I found that dredging was the best option. I was very surprised. Uh, but uh, dredging is typically the method of last resort because of the high cost. But there is a, there's a small power plant, Bajo and Chicaya in Colombia. They've been dredging continuously for 60 years now. A small dredging operation, but electric dredge. But yes, you, it, it is done at some sites, continuous dredging.
Uh, remember my, what I said. This is the most difficult sediment management problem in the world. Uh, exactly because of problems like that. There's, uh, there is no easy solution here. And it will, there will be costs. So I don't know the answer to that. I have not looked at the downstream reach. I know that from Gase Barotha down to the confluence with the Kabul River, the Indus is braided, which indicates uh, uh, limited natural sediment carrying capacity. Um, so this will be a very challenging project, and it will take decades. And people in this room, you should consider spending your life working on this problem. This is this is a huge problem, and <coughs> what I'm saying is, I don't have the solution here. I'm saying that there are some options that need to be looked at, but you do not have a choice because this Himalaya is not going to stop delivering sediment, and if you want to have sustainable use. 100, 200, 300 years into the future, you must solve this problem. And it's not going to be solved this year or next year, probably not within 10 years, maybe not even 20. But it's a long road and you have to start the journey. Upland? You, you could put sediment upland, you can take it out of the reservoir and not put it into the river. It involves higher pumping costs because you higher elevation. And again, you have to figure out where you're going to put it. It's huge volume of sediment. So again, this is a this is a problem that is not easy. And the it's a very difficult problem, but again, long term, you have no choice because the sediment will arrive. It will fill all of your dams and it will come downstream and it will fill all of your barrages and it will not stop. With respect to Basha, uh, Basha has the advantage of having a geometry and hydrology that allows flushing so you can preserve long-term storage. Basha, if I'm remembering correctly, has about 2 million kilometer, two, 2 billion cubic meters of dead storage and about 6 or 7 of live storage. Basha should be designed and operated to preserve live storage. Because you're going to need so much live storage along the end of Basha becomes an important component of that long term life storage. There will be others also. Perhaps in the end, you lose most of your storage at Tarbella and have to replace it with other reservoirs, but they all have to be able to maintain long term storage. If you have bottom outlets that are operated at Basha, which you have to have, there will be abrasion problems. But you look at a project that costs, let's say, $10 billion. So let's say that you have to spend a million dollars a year repairing abrasion problems so you can protect the project. That million dollars is nothing. It's nothing compared to the cost of the project. You have got to consider that when you have a project that's going to be managed in this manner, you will have maintenance and the maintenance with sediment will be higher than a 
typical dam. But this is the environment that you live in. This is the environment that you have to deal with. So you have those costs. For instance, some of the Indian dams, uh, hydropower dams, they have Pelton runners. Pelton runners, you know, a Francis runner, you typically have the generator on top and the runner down below. So to remove the runner, you take the generator apart and then you can pull out the runner. And you're talking several weeks of work. A Pelton runner, you can take it off and replace it <coughs> quickly. Indian plants, they're replacing Peltons in 24 hours. Why? They're replacing Pelton wheels two or three times a year because of abrasion. So again, think about how you operate in a high sediment environment. I mean, here you think about changing your runners three times a year, and that's unheard of. But in India, on high sediment yield rivers, they're changing runners three times a year. The runner can be repaired eight times, then it's discarded. So you're in a difficult environment, maintenance is going to be higher. Machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence is a very different type of a topic. Uh, within 30 years, maybe it will replace all the engineers. Within 60 years, maybe it will replace the human population. Uh, it's a huge, huge unknown. Uh, it's like we're introducing a new species onto the planet that will be smarter than we are. Think of it this way. <clears throat> you have a child. You work with a child for years, elementary school, high school, university. They're 21, start their master's degree. They're 25, they can go out and start working. By the time they're 30, with the work experience, Yes, they have knowledge and they're, they're, they're useful for designing and whatnot. Artificial intelligence, once you get the software running and you have a machine that runs it, to make a new copy, you just copy it onto the next hard drive. So we're looking at something that is very, very different. We do not we do not know what will happen. We have no way of predicting what will happen. And just to put things in perspective, I did my master's degree using a slide rule. Okay? I mean, that's how much things, and I'm, I'm not a young guy, but I'm not, you know, hundreds of years old either. So it's, uh, we have seen a lot of change, and the change will happen in the future. So I don't, know that it will help us uh, find a magic solution to the sediment problem, but it will definitely change everything. Everybody says, uh, my kids say, you did a 
my kids say, oh, you did a presentation, but you don't have any pictures. So I'm going to take a picture of all you guys. There we go. Good. Thank you. Yep. Um, data deficiency is a, is a problem everywhere. Uh, I've been doing work on a number of different hydro projects in Nepal, and the data in Nepal are much more deficient and much more unreliable than the data you have here. Uh, our strategy there is to design a project, oh, and let me say one other thing. Your sediment load varies a lot year to year. And one year, for instance, in some of the Nepali rivers, we're looking at loads that vary over, uh, over, or, over like five times from low year to high year. So what you do is you design the project so that it can manage your high sediment loads. And in this case, we're using low level outlets of flushing schedule and optimizing a flushing schedule by combining an operational model with a sediment transport model to determine what operational rules give us the best sediment flushing with the least impact power production. And once we have this operational, we can then challenge this with additional sediment. And if it can handle it, then this removes the data uncertainty. The data uncertainty is there, but we have a project which is robust so that if their data are wrong or as we saw that the sediment load increases in the future, that the sediment will still be, op be able to maintain storage. That's the only way we've been able to get around the, the data deficiencies. You can, one other thing that I would like to say though, if you in the, uh, yeah, the last page. When you make a sediment rating curve, people will go typically to Excel and draw a best fit line. That's not the way to do it. That's the starting point. Because what happens is that if you have a a line of best fit that doesn't necessarily mean that it will reproduce the sediment loads. I've, okay. Uh, this book here. This book on the right and available at ReservoirSedimentation.com, chapter six, describes a way to do make uh, sediment rating curves that are reliable or more reliable. Because what happens is that the best fit line does not necessarily reproduce the load correctly. For instance, you may have a lot of data when you have low flow, but low flow from sediment transport doesn't matter. You can throw all that data away because it's not transporting much sediment. But in the, in the regression equation, all those data will cause the slope of the curve to adjust. So this gives you a method to simply compare 
the load in your data set against the load given by your equation, and when they don't match, you have to adjust your equation. Mathematical best fit is not best fit for sediment load. Also, uh, you don't want to look at load versus discharge because load is discharge times concentration. So if you do load versus discharge, you have discharge on both axes, and so you have an autocorrelation. So it looks like you have a really good correlation when in fact you don't. So always look at concentration versus discharge. The other thing, uh, I don't know if you have it, but there should be a, a reference of sediment yields and different watersheds in Pakistan. And when you make your load computation, then compare that specific sediment yield tons per kilometer square per year with other watersheds to see if it looks reasonable. So if you have a high mountain watershed, glaciers, uh, you may expect a thousand tons per kilometer square per year, more or less. This is more or less what we have in Tarbella. So using two different methods to make sure that you're in the right ballpark. We're not worried about 10% errors. We're worried about 50%, 75% errors, sediment yields being double what you expect. That's the problem. Check dams. Why build check dams? You want to stop erosion. And the best erosion control method is vegetation. It's self-maintaining structures. Uh, vegetation does several things. It protects the soil from direct raindrop impact. You know, a raindrop hits the soil and it's like a tiny explosion. So it mobilizes sediment. But also, vegetation introduces organic material into the soil. And when you have organic material in the soil, your soil will clump into small little aggregates. So you want the vegetation. When you have a channel that has gullied or eroded uh, and you use a check dam, what you want to do is use that check dam to promote revegetation. If you're going to use check dams only as engineered structures, number one, they will quickly fill a sediment they don't have that much storage capacity. And number two, they require maintenance. And I have a nice collection of photos of failed check dams in different parts of the world. Um, so Taiwan, for instance, had extensive check dam development, including some check dams that had as much as 10 million cubic meters of storage. And big typhoon, they failed. And then there was storage, the sediment is released. So when you think of check dams, think of it in terms of revegetation. Revegetation is, is a viable strategy in areas that have enough rainfall, areas where the vegetation originally existed and was denuded by overgrazing or other bad practices. You can restore that. If you're in an area that naturally does not have vegetation, high Himalaya, you're not going to get vegetation. It's too cold. So, so check dams focus on achieving revegetation so that the vegetation is self-sustaining and that will reduce your erosion rates and stabilize your, your gullets. <laughs> 